Hello, my name is Bumi Banjo and you are welcome to The Maximum, a platform where you're equipped with the Word of God to enable you to become all that God has called you to be and to live your life at the max. Today is the part three of the series for the storms and we are talking today about faith for the storms. If you're yet to watch part one and part two of For the Storms, I want to enjoin you to please do so. It's going to lay a solid foundation for you to be able to glean some wisdom and understanding as we go further and conclude the series. Let's get right into it. is Matthew chapter 14 from verse 22 to 33. The backdrop for this is that Jesus had just fed the 5,000 men, the women and the children, scholars say about 15,000 people as a whole, right? And then he sent the disciples to get into their boat and go on to the other side. The Bible says while he went to pray. Okay, so and as the night fell, he was there praying alone, but the disciples who were now in the middle of the lake ran into trouble because right there in the middle of their journey, they encountered a storm and their boat was tossed about by high winds and heavy seas. So you can imagine how they must have felt. What would happen if I got on a boat and all of a sudden in the middle of the journey, uh, the, it, there came a storm and it was a tumultuous kind of storm probably will be very scared, super scared, and fearful of the situation. What is this going to lead to? All sorts of questions must have flooded the disciples' minds. Will our both capsize? Will we make it through this storm? By the way, where on earth is Jesus at such a time as this, you know? Was it worth it to obey him and, and get into the boat and now have to endure the storm? Or could we just have stayed with him on dry land, you know? What do we do amidst all of this, you know? So if you ask me, I'll say the storm the disciples were now facing had multiplied. What do I mean? There was a storm raging on the outside, the physical storm that was threatening their boat. But there was now this internal storm, the storm raging inside, the emotional storm that is raging on in their minds, rendering them perplexed with sheer fear. That's what I would feel if I was in that situation. And many times we go through storms in life that actually leaves us in fear, rendering us almost powerless, watching and waiting for what next is going to happen to us. And right in the midst of these troubles and uncertainty that comes with it and the palpable fear that has resulted out of it, Jesus shows up walking on the waves. And at first, of course, the disciples thought, hey, this is a ghost. And you can guess how they felt, you know, this was beyond belief. I mean, what are the chances that this is not a sin that I want to be part of in a movie, you know? I don't want to be tossed to and fro by the wind, by the, the heavy seas, and then all of a sudden I see a ghost, okay? So this is like a horror movie. And nobody counts for horror movies. Nobody wakes up saying today is going to be a nightmare for me. No, no, no. You actually say today is going to be a great day. And that was the, um, the expectation of the disciples. But what they got was more like right out of a horror movie. Um, and this takes us to verse 27 to 33. So let's go on. Faith for the storms. <laughs> then Jesus said to them in verse 27, Be brave and don't be afraid. I I'm here. Uh, there are no more comforting words or not more comforting words than this words that Jesus has spoken. Once Peter heard that in verse 28, the Bible says, Peter shouted out, Lord, if it's really you, then have me join you on the water. <laughs> you must hand it to Peter though, right? He'd rather be with Jesus on the water than stay in the boat with the other disciples. He was a restless and adventurous man. 
throughout the Bible we saw how Peter was restless, he was adventurous, he wanted more. He was always the guy that wanted more. He wanted to know more, he wanted to be more. You know, you just saw that about Peter. He probably in that moment got a flashback. First of all, don't I know that voice? Could this be Jesus? And number two, he, he, he reminded himself about the 5,000 people who were just fed, who had just been fed by Jesus Christ, who had just been given um, more than they could ever ask or imagine by Jesus. And after that, there were 12 basket full left. This was an astounding miracle that Jesus had just done. And Peter, I believe he just brought back to mind and he got a flashback and all of a sudden he was like, you know what? I am out of control in this boat. But you are never out of control. You are walking on the waves. Come on, beckon me to join you. I want to be where you are. I sometimes wonder, though, why he said, Lord, if it is really you, then have me join you on the water. <laughs> why not have us join you on the water? I mean, he wasn't alone in the boat. There were other disciples in the boat. Eleven other disciples were in the boat. But Peter got personal. I guess when we're in trouble, things get personal. When we're in trouble, we, we, we feel alone. We feel lonely. When we're in the midst of our storms, it's like nobody understands what we're going through. But more importantly, I think that he did the right thing. Because when you're in trouble, you need to first of all get delivered before you can deliver anybody else. And so Peter shouted out at Jesus. He said, if it is really you, beckon on me, call on me to come, and I will. And he did, you know. And Jesus replied, come and join me. So Peter stepped out onto the water and began to walk towards Jesus, says verse 29. And in verse 30, but when he realized how high the waves were, he became frightened and started to sink. Save me, Lord, he cried out. Jesus immediately stretched out his hand and lifted him up and said, what little faith you have, why would you let doubt win? And the very moment they both stepped into the boat, the raging wind ceased. Then all the disciples bowed down before him and worshiped Jesus. They said in adoration, you are truly the son of God. And this passage is so instructive to me, especially concerning a key ingredient we need for the storms of life. And again, today I'm talking about faith. Faith is that ingredient that we need to endure and to come out victorious in the storms of life. So let's, what does faith mean? The Bible defines faith in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. I'm reading the Passion Translation. It says, now faith brings our hopes into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we long for. It is all the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. Faith is evidence. Faith is the evidence that we require to prove what is still unseen. It is unseen, but in the realm of faith, there is evidence that it exists, okay? So when Peter cried out to Jesus, he spoke a few things to me about faith or about his faith. So let's look at what Peter did by faith. First of all, number one, he was willing to try. Faith takes risks on God. Faith takes risks on God. Peter was willing to try. He was willing to make a move, okay? Number two, he was bold despite the storm. He was bold despite the storm. None of the other disciples were bold enough to engage the situation. Peter engaged the storm because of his faith. His faith made him bold. To be bold is to be confident. It is to be courageous. It is to be daring. Peter was daring enough to engage the storm, to engage Jesus even in the midst of the storm. To be bold not in ourselves, but in God. He was bold because he felt this is Jesus and in the presence of Jesus, anything can happen. And so I'm going to take a risk on Jesus, but more importantly, I'm going to engage my boldness to engage the storms, to engage Jesus. He just encouraged himself by being bold, okay? So he was bodacious, he was bold despite the storms. So in the storms of life, when things are topsy-turvy, 
Are we bold enough? Do we allow our faith to cause us to be bold enough to engage the situations and the circumstances that life presents to us? In many situations in my life, I've had to be bold. I've had to shank fear and, and just step out boldly to be able to take on the storms of life, to be able to go when I don't even know uh, what I'm going to meet on the other side. So I want to encourage you to be like Peter, be bold, be bold. Despite the storms of life, despite the challenges that life may present and the situations that you come across in life may present, still be bold, be daring, be courageous, be confident that God will never leave you nor forsake you, all right? Number three, Peter's faith allowed him to believe in Jesus. He believed in Jesus. Faith believes. Faith takes risks. Faith is bold. Faith believes. Peter believed. He knew that if it was indeed Jesus, he was settled. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 in the Passion Translation says, And without faith living within us, it will be impossible to please God. For we come to God in faith, knowing that he is real. That is the belief that we have, knowing that he is real and that he rewards the faith of those who passionately seek him. Peter was passionately seeking Christ. He left the other 11 and he sought after Jesus Christ. And he said, if it is really you, I want to know if it is really you because I believe that if it is really you, you will not leave me in this storm to be destroyed. And so Jesus had no option but to reward the faith of Peter. Number four, he stepped out by faith onto the water and began to walk towards Jesus. Faith takes steps. Faith is dynamic. Faith is actionable. Faith is never static. Static faith is also what we refer to as fear, okay? Faith moves. Faith moves. Faith takes action. Faith steps out of the boat. Faith steps out of the comfort zone. Faith takes mountains, okay? Faith faces the lion. Faith faces Goliath. Faith steps out, even in the midst of the storm. Faith says, I'm not going to stay where I am. Like those lepers, if we sit here, we will die. Faith takes action. Faith makes bold moves. So you are saying, I have faith, but you're not making any bold moves. You have to make bold moves. You have to have crazy faith. You have to, faith, it, it is crazy because it, 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 it despite the circumstances, still moves, right? It still takes that action. It still is like, to somebody, it's not sane, you know? <laughs> it's insane. It, it, it doesn't follow. Why would you move and want to walk on water when there is a storm? But faith says, if I have God backing me up, I will not go down, even though all around me is a raging storm. So faith takes action. Faith is not paralyzed. Faith is not static. Faith does not say, okay, there's nothing I can do. Do you not see what's going on around? Um, there's recession and there is um, depression and there is uh, mental instability and there is all these things. There is sickness. There is, there is the pandemic. Faith says, though there is a pandemic, I'm still going to write that resume. I'm still going to look for a job. I'm still going to believe God for my healing. Faith says, I'm still going to go out on a limb and start that business. Faith still knows that despite what is going on around, if I don't move, fear is going to paralyze me and I'll be stuck in one position. Faith is never stuck. Faith goes on stock. So faith is actionable. Peter stepped out onto the water and he began to go towards Jesus. Peter knew that as long as he was in the direction of Jesus, he was in the direction of the will of Jesus, he was obeying Jesus' voice, he could never ever go down, all right? So faith moves. And while faith was moving, while Peter was moving through the storm towards Jesus, something happened. In verse 30, the Bible says, but when Peter realized how high the waves were, he became frightened and started to sink. Save me, Lord, he cried out. Wow, this was especially instructive to me. So I understand the faith of Peter now. But what happened to the faith of Peter when he began to look around him? He came to a realization. And that takes me to number five. Fear nullifies faith. Fear nullifies faith. 
Walking in the flesh nullifies the working, the working of the spirit. Walking in the flesh nullifies the working of the spirit. Peter was working by the spirit. Jesus, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So Jesus spoke and said, come. And the spirit of God was released and Peter was able to walk in the realm of faith, right? But then at some point he began to walk in the flesh. He came to a realization. He looked around him and flesh took over. His eyes, his natural senses, his flesh came in the way. Suddenly he became frightened and started to sink. When our natural flesh, our own senses come into play, what happens is that we yield to our flesh and what yields to the flesh is fear. Okay, fear becomes attractive to the flesh. The flesh says we can't do this because fear has presented itself and the flesh acquiesces to fear because fear is a spirit but it's a spirit that, that can only come to you when you allow it. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear. So it must be the devil who appeals to our carnality that opens us up to the spirit of fear. I hope you're following what I'm trying to say. When we're out of the working of the spirit, we begin to walk physically in the flesh and then fear is attractive to the flesh and attracted to the flesh and the flesh acquiesces to the spirit of fear. Okay. So fear nullifies faith. The waves were always high. The Bible did not record that suddenly the, the waves grew higher. But Peter did not realize that before because he was working in the spirit, right? But then when he started to walk in the flesh, he realized, whoa, <laughs> this is heavy storms. These are high waves, you know? But he was not focused on the waves before. He was more focused on Jesus. His eyes were fixed on Jesus. The Bible says if your eye be single, your whole body will be filled with light. But if you're looking everywhere, then your body will be filled with darkness. It will suddenly be filled with fear, right? So he had enough faith, enough measure of faith, I will say. The quantity, if I will say, of his faith was there. And the quality of his faith was there. Enough to take him out of the boat because the quality of his faith was based upon the word of Jesus and the belief in Jesus, right? So he had enough of that faith to take him out on the water. But when he realized, he, he became fully aware of the waves, he came out of the spirit and began to walk in the flesh. Then he became frightened and began to sink. Fear makes people sink. The fear that your business will not make it is what's going to sink that business if you don't take care. The fear that you will never get married or you'd never find the right guy or you'd never find the right girl is going to make the thought or the ability to get married sink okay the fear that you will never get that job that you desire really is going to make you sink and settle for less than the best what is making you sink the fear of what there are so many fears that present itself to us on a daily basis you don't want to go out because of the fear of an accident right you don't want to um you, you don't you don't want to launch out into the deep into that business because of the fear that the business may sink and you might as well just stay with with the job that's just giving you a salary but you know god has called you to the business because there are many people waiting for that business to succeed so that they can get a job so that you know you can reach out and have more than enough to be a blessing to people even overseas and so on so there is a huge plan that god has but you have a qs to the little and the simple reason is because you are afraid to launch out and it's out of fear so fear makes people sink it paralyzes fear stops us short of our destination or our destiny fear robs us of what could be the heights that we could attain the depths that we could explore fear makes people sink okay but what happened what did peter do Number six, faith can be reactivated by prayer. So where fear nullified Peter's faith, Peter decided to pray. He decided to call on God. And that calling on God, that prayer reactivated faith in Peter. He said, save me, Lord. So though Peter was sinking, he knew what to do. He cried out to Jesus. The Bible says in the book of James, chapter 5 and verse 16, the latter part, the B part, and it's in the Amplified Version that I want to read. It says, the heartfelt and persistent prayer of a righteous man, a believer, can accomplish much. 
when put into action and made effective by God. It is dynamic and can have tremendous power. I love this. Prayer makes power available. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man makes tremendous power available that is dynamic in its working. So that prayer that Peter prayed reactivated his faith in God. He has started believing the hype of the situation, much like you have started believing the hype of what the people told you, what your teacher told you, what your uh, boss told you, and what people in your family had told you that you cannot make it because of the kind of past that you have, because of the kind of ADHD or whatever sickness or whatever disease that you have, that you can never make it because of the storms of life that has caused you to become less than who God has called you to be. But what I'm telling you is all you have to do is cry out to God, just like Peter cried out. And his faith in God, his belief in God that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what he could ask or imagine was reactivated. Faith rose back up in Peter again. If the storms of life have snuffed out your faith, please don't continue living a faithless life. Cry out to God and he will answer you and he will reactivate your faith. The Bible says, this is what Jesus said in Matthew 14, verse 31. The Bible says that Jesus, first of all, immediately stretched out his hand and lifted him up. First of all, when you pray, God lends you a hand of help. God does not leave you drowning. God does not leave you sinking in fear. God doesn't want you to be paralyzed. God is always saying, arise, and he will lend a hand to lift you up. The Bible says Jesus stretched out his hand and lifted Peter up and said, what little faith you have. Why would you let doubt win? And I'm asking you today, what little faith you have. Why would you let doubt win? Why would you doubt that you would make it in that business? Why would you doubt that you will make it as a parent? Why would you doubt that you will make it as a spouse? Why would you doubt that you will make it in your job? Why would you doubt? Why would you let doubt win concerning your situation? Why would you let doubt even have a say at all? Many of the times we allow doubt to have a say in our lives. We let doubt win. We let doubt reason out our belief in God, okay? Takes me to number seven. Faith overcomes doubt. Doubt wins only when we lose faith. Our capacity to believe God. Faith is our capacity to believe God. It's not the measure, it's not the quantity of faith we have. It is the capacity we have to believe God. So when God is saying, when Jesus is saying, oh, you have little faith, what he's saying is, oh, you have little capacity to believe me. Where did your capacity to believe me run out? Is it because you saw the high wave suddenly? Because you have come back into the flesh? He's saying that where is your capacity to believe God? Many people talk about, oh, that little faith, maybe it's because his faith was small. Yes, the Bible talks about small faith, little faith. But what God is saying is that that faith, though small, it can be powerful. It can have capacity enough to be able to move mountains. Let's read the book of Luke chapter 17 from verse 5 to 6. He says, the apostle said to the Lord, that's to Jesus, increase our faith. That means our ability to confidently trust in God and in his power. And the Lord said, if you have confident abiding faith in God, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, which has very strong roots, be pulled up by the roots. Now, small faith picking up big trees. Your small faith is picking up big trees with strong roots. Your small faith is picking up big situations that have, that have been there for a long time. Situations that have existed from the days of your forefathers, your grandfathers, your great grandfathers. Your small faith is able to destroy the principalities and the powers. He says, if you have confident, abiding faith, it means that it can be small, but it must be confident. It can be small, but it must abide in the word of God. If you have confident abiding faith in God, even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this small berry tree, which has very strong roots, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea. You can move this strong tree by the small faith that you have. And if the request, the Bible says, was in agreement with the will of God, 
that huge big mulberry tree that huge big gargantuan problem would have obeyed you we let situations overcome us because we deem them bigger than our faith but if we can try you and i can try to have confident abiding faith in god also known as trust though i can't say it i have evidence of it and my evidence is in my belief in god and his power then no situation will be too difficult for us because Mark chapter 11 verse 23 in the Amplified Version, this is what Jesus said, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his or her heart, in God's unlimited power, but believes that what he or she says is going to take place, it will be done for him or her in accordance with God's will. I hope this is making sense to you. By the way, let me ask, are you gonna like this video? Are you gonna share this video? Are you gonna to subscribe to this channel? And are you gonna click the notification bell icon so that you can get more videos even as we upload them? Please do, because we've got to continually make this gospel public, okay? So listen, if you believe in God, your belief in God and the action that you take concerning your belief in God is going to result into mountain moving miracles. It's going to result in mulberry uprooting gargantuan miracles. Each of us need to be able to take risks on God. God has never failed and will never fail concerning you. No. That situation, no matter how huge it is, presenting itself before you, has to bow to God. The Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And you and I ought to believe that. That our faith can move mountains. That our faith can uproot trees. That our faith can tear down and our faith can build up. Okay? And the last thing I want to talk about is the fact that faith gives victory. Faith gives victory. Your faith, my faith, is only going to result in victory. Matthew chapter 14, 32 in the Passion Translation and 33 as well, as we round up that scripture, says, and the very moment they both, that's Peter and Jesus, that's you and Jesus, step into the boat, the boat of your business, the boat of your marriage, the boat of your single life, the boat of your career, the boat of your academics, the boat of your relationships. The raging wind ceased. That is your testimony in Jesus' name. That is my testimony in Jesus' name. I receive that for myself. As long as Jesus and I step into the boat of any feat, any endeavor, Every raging wind must cease. And that will be your own testimony as well, in Jesus' name. And verse 33 caps it all and says, Then all the disciples bowed down before him and worshipped Jesus. Then whoever else is watching, whoever else needs inspiration, whoever else is even maybe probably doubting you and doubting your God, they will have to bow down and worship him because that which you and I will do by faith will cause more people to believe in God and to come to him and to trust him and to begin to walk with him. It says they bow down before him and they worship Jesus. And they said in adoration, this is true worship. You are truly the son of God. And that is all God wants us to do to use our faith to bring glory to his name while we're enjoying the benefits of it as well. And so I want to let you know, Perhaps you're going through storms, raging winds, high waves, and heavy seas. You need faith for the storms. For the storms that life is going to present, the challenges, the upheavals, the, the vicissitudes of life, you need faith. It is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. Remember that through faith, we obtain victory. Through faith, Sarah obtained him. She received strength from God to conceive, even though her body was already dead. Miracles happen when we use the faith we have for the storms that we have to go through in life. I love you guys so much. I hope that you were blessed. I hope you got something from this teaching. And I hope that 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 you got from this teaching will enable you to be able to face victoriously 
the storms of life. Again, do me a favor, please like this video, share it with your family and friends, subscribe to this channel, and click that notification bell icon so you can receive videos whenever we upload it. I'll see you next time on The Maximum. God bless you.